that's one of the reasons that the difference between dissertation titles and the books that come out of the dissertation is very different. Um, yeah. When it's indexed, though, is it not indexed according to um, keywords that you would have provided? So you could have the keywords that normally would have been in your title, but then actually have maybe yeah. another heading with your longer title as a subtitle? Or? Yeah, it is often indexed like that, but sometimes dissertation listings in mm -hmm. those, those databases, the things that people actually see are the titles. So. So if they search on the terms, then they would find things, but if they're just sort of browsing, you know, so it's yeah. just a consideration and mm -hmm. something to talk about with your supervisor. Okay. Um, so this is just about organizing the sort of material realities of this, because one of the things that happens is that you will produce a tremendous amount of stuff, even if you're writing a BA thesis, there's just a lot of stuff that's associated with it. And the first material reality that I want to just underline is how many people right now, if their computer did not start, have a, a backup that's accessible, that they know where it is? That is great. Okay, but that is only about 30% of the people in this room. So let me tell you about my friend Justin, who is a computer head and a Linux user and had many, many versions of his dissertation backed up on different um, partitions of his hard drive, right? So if one partition failed, he felt sure that he would um, be able to go into another partition and get the stuff out. And then someone stepped on his computer and his hard drive was absolutely total. And he had no other backups. And he ended up having to retype uh, a third of the dissertation based on old copies of paper copies that his professors had that he'd emailed them and he rewrote the rest of it. It was just like, and then he, it took him an extra year to graduate. So just think of Justin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like get an external hard drive or get a Gmail account and just forward yourself versions of everything you write. And forward versions of stuff you write because, or save versions of stuff you write because sometimes you'll write something and then you'll delete it and then later you'll want to go back and use it. So I know this is like, you know, I'm not trying to be insulting and telling you this, like Justin's one of my smartest it's just something that a lot of times we don't do as academics, and we just really need to. Okay, otherwise I have some suggested tactics, and these are just things that you should think about and see if any of them sound like they might be useful, or you could try them out and see if they help you. One thing to do is, because almost everyone writes on a computer, uh, the dissertation or the thesis becomes very electronic and kind of imaginary. Or if it has a material reality, it's got this sort of pixelated reality. It's just there on your screen. And one way that really helps people materialize that is to actually have a physical representation that's similar to something that like a publisher puts together when they're putting out a book. Physical representation of the thing. So in this case, in some cases, people actually have a binder that has the number of pages of paper that they decided on you know, two slides ago and they print on those pieces of paper. And they put notes on those pieces of paper that send them to physical files, you know, like, go look at the file of these articles, or go look at this data, right? So if you, if you try this, what you have is a physical mock-up of what the whole thing's gonna look like. And it makes it very real, and you can see when you're actually doing things, because you print them out and you put them in the binder. That's one mode. Another mode, and this is something I really think you should do, is create a box or a big file that you're just gonna call archive. And this is the place that after your supervisor, your committee, gives you comments, they'll give you written comments, or you know, after you've completed a certain set of things, you just pitch it in this box. You don't recycle it, you don't, once you've dealt with it, you don't think about it anymore. You put it there. So it's there if you need to go back to it, but it's put away so you don't have to think about it anymore. So this is another way of, of um, trimming down the number of things that you have to hold in your mind. So the more things that you're holding in the mind, in, in general, the more anxious you feel. So this box marked archive is the place where things that you definitely don't want to throw away yet go. Um, it's a place where if you haven't had good backups, you at least have those old versions of chapters of the thesis. Um, and it's there. And it might be that this is also a place where you pitch articles that you thought might be useful but they don't seem like they're going to be useful, but you don't want to recycle them yet, 
you just put them in the box marked archive. And you keep that box until the whole thing is done and handed in. And at that point, you can get it. Part of this is to develop a system for, for knowing when you've responded to comments. So you'll pass in physical things, and your profs will send back physical things. And a lot of the time, you'll put those things into your document. You'll address the comments. Um, and it's good to have a system for knowing when you've addressed those comments. So that could be a particular pen that you check off the comment with, um, a particular file that you hold those things in that says something like, comments to be entered, whatever. Um, whatever works for you to mark that, you should develop a system for doing it. I am someone who believes in saving the planet, and I also believe that it's good to print drafts out. Um, not only to have a physical thing, but also because being able to read things on paper when you're working and revising and being able to make notations on it is a really different kind of activity than reading things on a computer screen. When you read the same thing over and over again on a computer screen, your brain goes into this groove and you literally cannot see that you have the same sentence in two different places. And you really can see that when you have it in a printout. So you see that some of these things actually like all build together. So if you're printing drafts out and putting them in the physical representation of the manuscript, then you have physical things and you read them over. And so this connects to this, this last bit, which is um, I think it's important to regard the computer as a tool for production, not organization. So the computer is something that's very, very useful for having a certain fluidity with text, for being able to move large things around, for being able to save multiple versions of things. But it's a terrible, terrible tool for organizing. So when you print things out or when you take them out of that space, you actually can start to think about the difference between the organization, the physical material organization of the thesis, and what kinds of things you want to do. So, so organizing means things like being able to see what you've got and how you want it to fit together. Um, production is like you go in and you And there's just, there's something that I've seen happen for myself and for other people with computers, and I don't know if you have this experience, but is that um, it's hard to keep any stake sometimes, right? You can write a lot and delete it all um, because you're like, oh, that's terrible, you know, or I didn't, I didn't get anywhere with that. So you want to sort of resist some of that, and making things material is one way to do that. Any questions about any? slogan that says that the root of all neurosis is poor time management. Um, and I think that's true to some extent. One of the things that I've observed is that basically when you start doing thesis or dissertation work, it's very rare to find anyone who feels that they have enough time to do everything. It's um, often a feeling of being really overwhelmed, that you've added something that you don't quite know what to do, and it feels like it's it's impossible to do everything. And this is in fact true. Um, it is impossible to do everything. So given that it's impossible to do everything that you'd like to do, all the research you'd like to do, all the going bowling that you'd like to do, all the having nice dinners with a bottle of wine, all the exercising, all the going to interesting lectures, given that it's impossible to do everything you'd like to do, <coughs> one of the things to again make a decision about is what's important to do. Because when you approach all of the tasks that you have, and all of the readings that you have, and all of the things that you'd like to look into, as though all of them were equally important, you quickly get um, completely frozen because it's overwhelming. So, seeing what is more important than anything than other things is a really important skill to develop. And this doesn't mean that um, you know those things are important, most important forever. They might be most important at a particular time. Being able to explicitly say to yourself, it is more important that I read this article than that I go to this lecture, or it's more important that I take this time to do this than that I, you know, 
So again, however you do that, that's something that it's worth foregrounding and allowing yourself to hierarchize things. So one way to think about time management is um, that it is actually more about managing guilt than about managing time. And what do I mean by this? So guilt is something that is part of the economy of academia in, to, to one extent or another. Um, most academics feel bad for not spending enough time with their kids, for not eating well, for not reading well, for, and, and then, again, if you don't feel this way, that's great. But a lot of academics do. And guilt is something that is um, a major, it, it is a major interference with your sort of good judgment and capacity to get work done. And your good judgment and capacity to get work done is kind of mostly what you have going for you in doing grad studies, right? Like in, or in writing a thesis. So it's important to nurture the aspect of yourself that is full of good sense and that is able to do things. And so there is something where it gets very functional to just identify that affect of guilt as something that is serving you very poorly. And to, as much as you can, just jettison. One way that sometimes is useful for thinking about this is this 80-20 rule. Has everyone heard about this? Anyone not? This came out of, I believe, an 1897 Italian um, political theorist who noticed that 20% of the people in Italy owned 80% of the land. And I have no idea if this actually works mathematically, but it's widely, widely cited in time management sort of studies and strategies. And it basically says that 80% of the good that you get out of something is accomplished in 20% of the input you put into it. So this means that although it may seem to you that spending six hours in the library working on your dissertation is you know, really, really good, it actually, the amount of productive work that you've done, the, the, the product that you've accomplished there, will have probably happened in a fraction of that time. So, Guilt tends to produce spending lots and lots of time doing things. Um, thinking about the things that you're actually, the good that you're actually getting out of something is coming from only 20% of the time that you're, you put in might liberate you from many, many fruitless hours sitting in front of the computer when you actually are not in any space to get work done. So you can look it up and see if it's something that, um, that appeals to you. But one of the things that I am pretty convinced of, having read some studies on effective writing, is that most good writing, most writing that people feel good about and that ends up actually going in and being part of their thesis or dissertation, happens in fairly short, much shorter than you think, um, chunks of time. And so this is a reason to aim for short, productive, concise, energetic blocks of writing that when you're writing, it actually isn't a really good space to just try to exhaust yourself to the point where you produce something. Um, that's not very, it doesn't work that way, actually. Um, and so I'll get into some of the, the things that will maybe help you with that. Does anyone have questions about this stuff? Well, in your, in your that's sort of scary, that 80-20 rule, because it's so true. <laughs> it's very true, and it's a bit late to realize it. But um, if you if you realize, like I'm, I'm aware of that, that the, the writing is more spontaneous and productive at peaks, but it's not a waste of, how do you efficient, how would you recommend using the most of your time if you are in a library mm -hmm. all day, because you're trying to discipline yourself? I mean, it's not a waste of time, I guess, if you're doing research and you're reading articles and you're, it's still not a waste of time, right? Right. Yeah, so part of it is about being able to see, so I don't know if everyone could hear that, but if the 80-20 rule is a little scary and you are gonna spend many hours in the library, how are you going to actually access the 20% of the time when you're actually producing yeah. things? Yeah. So part of it is to just notice what space you're in when you write well and be trying to produce that space more often. So that means that if you know that you're someone who is actually like very perky and you have a lot of energy in the morning, you, be, you try to structure your stuff so that maybe you don't check your email in the morning. You instead put in some time writing. Um, 
if you notice that around three, after you have an afternoon tea, you're just like, you're ready to go. You know, then you structure the times when you're writing so that you, you pay attention to the times when you have good luck writing, mm -hmm. and you begin to create those forms. Yeah, the e not checking the email, but good tip. Right, <laughs> you know, like, you can, you can sort of plan, and so my next slide is actually okay. some, I'm feeling some very specific emails. <laughs> some very specific things. Um, so these are six of the most important things that I have learned in the process of doing this stuff and um, working with other people on their writing. And I sometimes feel a lot like a proselytizer about these things. Okay. So the first thing is planning ahead. And this is something that can be done very, very quickly. Planning ahead means <coughs> separately from the time that you're spending writing, sitting down and making an itinerary for what you're gonna do. So this can be, it can literally take two minutes. The best time to plan ahead is at the end of your writing day, the end of your work day, or the day the next day. The best way to plan ahead is to leave a tiny bit of something that you know you're going to say next undone. Um, something that you're going to write up, a quote that you want to explain, uh, whatever. So when you plan ahead, you're not in the writing space, you're projecting what you want to accomplish. And it's not write chapter three. It's not that big, or it's not right thesis, right? <laughs> it's like, explain that quote, you know, compare those results. It's very, very specific. And it's, it's manageable, right? So you give yourself something so that the next day, or whenever you're starting writing next, you're, you don't just get in there and feel like, ah, I better play some solitaire for a minute here. I just need to update my status on Facebook. And then I'll start writing. You have, you know, physic it's good to just write this down on a little a post-it note, an index card, someplace. So you just look at it, and it's as though someone gave you a task. You know, they said, explain the quote on page 16. <coughs> and you're just like, I can explain the quote on page 16. So it's it's about giving yourself these kind of little hooks to get in. in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So don't spend a lot of time on it. And don't have it happening while you're writing. That's the only, you know, you might do it, you might plan ahead for the day while you're having coffee in the morning or while you're waiting to pick your kid up. You know, like it's just, it's very short, it's material, it's written down somewhere and it's something you can just do. Okay, this next one, this is the part where I'm gonna sound kind of like a slightly uh, fundamentalist or something. <laughs> I am such a believer in 45 minute units, I cannot tell you how much I'm a believer in them. 45 minute units comes from the principle, which apparently people have done studies on, and I haven't actually read them, so that's just sort of like meaningless filler to sort of convince you that this is really true, that people's feeling of productivity, their attention, their concentration, goes up after 45 minutes of doing a particular task. But their retention and their production goes down. So if you've been working on something, according to Dorothy Duff Brown from Hoa, I learned this, if you've been working on something for an hour and 15 minutes, chances are you'll feel like you're really, really, really getting work done. And chances are that you're really, really not remembering what you're reading and you're really, really not writing very well. So just, this is the one that I actually just, please just try this. Just try it for like three days if you're writing right now. If you have a timer on your computer, you have a kitchen timer, or you have someone who will be able to tell you that 45 minutes have elapsed, try writing in 45 minute emails. And in these units, you do not get up to make a cup of tea, you do not answer the phone, you do not answer email, you do not answer the door unless you're really expecting something. You don't even go pee, you don't get a snack, you definitely don't go on Facebook, you just write. Or you just read. You just do the thing that you're doing. That's all you do. And it's not connected to the clock, you don't look at the clock, it's just connected to the timer or the friend who is looking at the clock. So it's about taking yourself out of clock time. It's about giving yourself permission to focus on something. And it's about giving yourself a set end point. So, and this is very important, and it's gonna get into um, number four. It's very important, for some reason, I don't know why, that you have a point where you're gonna be forced to stop. Because for some reason, we tend to work and work and work until we're just so tired we can't work anymore. 
if we have a point where we are making ourselves stop or someone is making us stop, we tend to work very, very efficiently, especially in the last 10 minutes before. It doesn't matter how long the time is. So this is a way to like use that. I wrote my entire dissertation in three <coughs> units a day um, in about three months. Like not very much time, right? That's, that's not three hours a day. Doesn't sound like very much, right? If you said to yourself, I'm gonna work on my dissertation, I'm not doing anything else, I'm gonna work on it for three hours a day, you might feel like that's like pretty lazy. Somehow if you say to yourself, I'm just gonna try to get three units of writing done today, that seems like a perfectly legitimate amount of work to do. Yeah. So you do your 45 minute union and then just take a break, do something else for a half hour, an hour, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, or, you take, a break. or whatever. you take a break for five minutes. You know, then you check your email for five minutes, you look out the window. Ideally, you actually get up from your computer, move away from the computer, you know, like walk away from it, do something. You know, you take a little break of whatever time. And that is just something that you're, you know, and then you go back and you know how many units you're going to try to do. That's part of the planning, right? Like three units of writing today, or one unit of research, two units of writing. Does someone here have a question? It was just how much time in between yeah. to get the same attention and retention level. Any amount of time, apparently, actually. Any amount of time? Like, more than a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but moving away from the computer, taking a break, making a note if you know what you need to start back on, yeah. in the same way that you do with planning. Yeah. Any other questions about the? Some, some people do 50-minute units. It's not orthodox, but apparently it works for but really, like, I just can't tell you how many people I know who have finished their dissertations just because of 45 minutes. It's astonishing. Yeah. What if um, you hit a writer's block for 45 minutes? Do you still sit there for 45 minutes? <laughs> yes. You sit there for 40 minutes. You do. Yeah. You do. And in a second, I'll tell some things that you can do when you hit a writer's block.